Okay, doke. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the, the last BSM lecture, and it's going to be slightly uh, more disjointed than the other lectures. Um, the reason being that we held this vote uh, two days ago on what to have in the last the last lecture, and there was large, almost no support for just supersymmetry, uh, large support for supersymmetry and extra dimensions, and and reasonable support for extra dimensions. So I'm going to try and cover both of the topics, um, sort of half and half. Um, of course, my job, if it, my job here is to, to partially decide uh, or, or to make an informed decision about what should be in the course um, uh, on your behalf. And I should say that although the, I could tell from the vote that there was not much interest in supersymmetry, um, and presumably that is because of the, the null results of the LHC, it's maybe seen, the MSSM is maybe seen as a bit of a, an outdated topic to study. Um, one should be uh, careful when, when thinking about the reasons for that. And um, there's, I think there are sometimes sort of sociological elements at play. And for that reason, that's one of the reasons I want to cover supersymmetry today. And indeed, the things I will cover for supersymmetry and extra dimensions as part of this uh, goal I have of sort of equipping you with general tools, I want to go through some of the, the very basic and general features of these theories. Of course, I will cover the, the application that they have to the electroweak hierarchy problem. But more importantly than that is that you get a feel for, for how they work structurally and the, the, the way you can do calculations within these frameworks and, and build models or whatever. And that is because, nonetheless, although supersymmetry hasn't been discovered at the LHC, it's still a very uh, compelling candidate for, for a symmetry of nature at some point, uh, at some energy. There are many uh, reasons why you might believe that, that that could be so. And the other thing is that su both in supersymmetry and extra dimensions, there are, a uh, there are tools that are useful in many, many areas of theoretical physics without even thinking about the Higgs. You know, if you're working on, uh, if you end up working in slightly more formal areas of theoretical physics, um, you could end up using, moving between different numbers of dimensions fluidly all the time. You know, if you're working on ADS CFT or something like this. Um, and even when you're thinking about black hole physics, it can sometimes be, be useful to, to work in different numbers of dimensions if you're just working in some uh, subregion or something like this. So the tools of extra dimensions that I will discuss are, are broadly applicable, not just to weak scale physics. And similarly for, for, for supersymmetry. You know, supersymmetry is one of the last, uh, or is, um, is the last possible symmetry of uh, space time that we could have. And for that reason, it comes up in all sorts of places that don't have any application to the Higgs. For example, uh, when people are ca calculating sc scattering amplitudes or non-perturbative behavior in quantum field theories, um, supersymmetry is an incredibly useful tool because it can simplify calculations to the extent that you can actually answer a question. And that can give you a, a hint about the behavior of um, uh, uh, more general quantum field theories. Um, or in its own right, uh, there are many interesting results in supersymmetric field theories that is purely academically very interesting and worthwhile knowing about, um, even if they have nothing to do with, with any immediate feature of nature. Okay, so that's sort of my philosophy for these lectures. Um, so to try and equip you, equip you more with a toolkit than with an in-depth study of some uh, particular uh, model. And for, for extra dimensions, we will, we will consider uh, in the, the, the first 15 minutes or so the, the extra dimensional Planck scale versus the four dimensional Planck scale. If we were to live in some, uh, say on some brain, in some four dimensional uh, 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 region, confined to some four dimensional region of a, of a five dimensional theory, um, or if the dimensions are just so small that we can't, um, can't access them. So many people have considered this question. I'm sure you've heard of kaluza klein theories and so on. Um, and the one, one reason to, to see that, the, that this, um, that extra dimensional theories can be interesting for the electroweak scale is to, uh, the, the hierarchy between the electroweak scale and the Planck scale is to go back to one of the first things we did in the first lecture, was, which is just dumb uh, dimensional analysis when you put H bar back into the action. So you had this as an exercise yesterday. You can see that the Planck scale um, i.e. the guy that lives in front of the coupling between the graviton and the stress energy tensor of the standard model, um, is actually has dimensions of a mass scale divided by a coupling scale. So this tells us that 
the thing, so this is the theory where, there, this is sorry, the, the mass scale where the, the UV completion uh, might kick in. So um, where new resonances associated with, with uh, gravity might show up. For example, in string theory, these would be the resonances of the strings. Um, and this is some coupling in the theory, and a priori, we don't know what this coupling is. Um, but essentially, that means that this is sort of, from our perspective, from a, as an effective field theory perspective, we don't actually know where the UV completion of gravity might kick in. If the coupling is order one, then it means the UV completion of gravity is going to kick in around the Planck scale. Uh, naively, but if we have some, some extremely small coupling, this could kick in much earlier, and in particular, if the UV completion of gravity kicks in at the TeV scale, then this would require an extremely small coupling in the theory somewhere. How might this resolve um, our puzzle about the hierarchy between the Planck scale and the weak scale? Well, if the true UV completion of gravity kicks in at, say, a TeV or a few TeV, then we would expect the mass corrections to the Higgs from that UV completion to be around a TeV or a few TeV, which are not huge, much smaller than, for example, Planck scale squared. So if we can find a theory with a very small coupling, um, we have a strategy that could explain the hierarchy between the, the uh, weak scale and um, the Planck scale. And indeed, we can just use dimensional analysis. Imagine we're just doing something very dumb, very back of the envelope, um, not in any way precise. And we say, well, what if there's an extra dimension um, in nature? What is the only dimensionful, say, we're assuming, we'll assume that this is a flat extra dimension. What's the only dimensionful parameter associated with that extra dimension? It's the length. There's nothing else in the game. That's the only other dimensionful uh, unit we have to work with. So let's construct something that has dimensions of coupling from the length and the only other thing we've measured, which is the Planck scale. So you do that, and you see that the dimensions of M Planck are the minus one has the dimensions of coupling. Which is telling you that if you take R really, really big, you've got some effect of coupling in the theory which is very, very small. And this is essentially one way, we're going to see it from a much more um, uh, orthodox perspective in a second, but this is one way of seeing why uh, I, the existence of a large extra dimension could, could provide you with precisely the small coupling you need to explain a, a large hierarchy. And then the, the, the basic idea from there is that maybe um, uh, the, the, the fundamental Planck scale, essentially, that we will see that we'll call this M5, which will be the five-dimensional Planck scale, is, is not very far away at all. So we would say that the, you know, the hierarchy between the, the Fermi scale and the fundamental Planck scale, which is not the Planck scale that we measure, I'll call it M fundamental, um, this could could potentially explain why there's why why these two things are actually don't have a hierarchy at all, or at least they only have a small hierarchy. Um, and the only reason I say small is that LHC constraints have already pushed this up to be above a few TV. Okay, so what are the how do we see this in in more detail? So that's the sort of hand wavy argument for for why extra dimensions can can give you a strategy for understanding the the Planck weak uh, scale hierarchy. But now we'll do this in a little, more, little bit more detail. Again, I'm trying to give you a, a, a very qualitative handle on, on how things work. So if, now we imagine we have some set of extra dimensions. I'm not even going to limit us to one extra dimension. Just you know, say it could be three or, or whatever. And imagine at the moment that the, the extra dimensions are flat, so there's no wacky geometry going on. Then. Um, if we have a particle in the extra dimension, it must still satisfy you know, p squared minus m squared equals e squared, the usual uh, equation we know from special relativity. If this extra dimension is flat, there's nothing special going on. If we're living in the bulk of this extra dimension and we fire a massless particle, um, it should satisfy the following equation. where this is the, this is, uh, you know, so I can call that P0 squared. Um, so it's just, you know, E squared minus P squared equals zero. It's massless. So we have special, we have uh, Lorentz symmetry in the extra dimension. So is everyone comfortable with this? I'm seeing some puzzled faces. So this is the, the three-dimensional, this is our three-dimensional momentum, and this is the extra-dimensional one. So imagine we just lived in four dimension. We recognize this equation, right? Yes, please say yes. <laughs> 
Um, so now if we're in an extra dimension, we just have the same old equation, except it's extra dimensional. So there's a, the, the extra dimensional component of the momentum in there as well. But what do we see in 4D? We, in 4D, we can't measure the momentum along the extra dimension. We have no idea what it is. What do we see in 4D? Well, we can just rearrange this equation. We see particles that satisfy an equation like this, where this is the, the 4D energy, the 4D, so the 3D momenta, momentum is equal to PE squared. So what we observe is particles who appear to have a mass. Well, for our, for, from our perspective, they do have a mass. But that mass is just the momentum that's being carried in the extra dimension. So in 4D, this is just you know, the, the, you know, P mu, P mu equals m squared, usual equation. Where now m squared is, is the, the extra dimensional uh, momentum. So you can see straight away, straight off the bat, if we have some extra dimensional space, I'll draw it as one extra dimension, but it could be n dimensions. Um, we, have, we will have a, a massless mode in 4D, and if we have a massless mode, that mode has to carry zero extra dimensional momentum. And the operator that, that uh, measures the, the extra, dimensional, extra dimensional momentum is the same as an operator that measures the 4D momentum, which is just a derivative, but in this case, a derivative along the extra dimension. So we'll have a massless guy. who satisfies, you know, if, let's call this particle uh, uh, H for the graviton, so dy. Let's call it dm. I will use capital letters, uh, capital, um, uh, you know, m and n and l um, to describe extra dimensional derivatives and then the usual mu's and nu's and alphas and betas to describe uh, uh, 40. Uh, 40 derivatives. So this guy is flat. So this is telling us already that say we started off with the full-blown graviton in 5D. Now the graviton in 5D is massless in 5D, just like the graviton in 4D is massless in 4D. So the graviton in 5D satisfies this equation. And that tells us that if we have a graviton in 5D, if there's some, so, some uh, uh, um, mode that has zero extra dimensional derivatives, then it will be massless in 4D, and we can just recover a massless 4D graviton as usual. But on top of that, we will have uh, additional modes that carry, have non-zero momentum along the extra dimension. Have non-zero momentum along the extra dimension, and to our from our perspective, they will look like they just have mass. Furthermore, in a flat extra dimension, we know what sort of wave functions uh, live, what sort of momentum you can have in an extra dimension. We know from doing quantum mechanics as an undergrad, particle in a box, that if you live in a box, your momentum is quantized in units of the radius of the box. So we will have wave functions that look like this and so on, and they have quantized momenta. Um, which are integer units of the inverse radius of the box. So the momenta, the, the momenta will look like um, n over r, where r is the radius of the box. You can um, obviously generalize this to multiple dimensions, which is telling us by, again, this dumb equation that from our 4D perspective, we will have not only a massless zero mode for a graviton or anything else. If you put a gauge field in the bulk of this extra dimension, it would be exactly the same. We will also see massive quantized modes, which from our perspective, there will be an infinite tar of massive particles um, that correspond to the infinite tar of quantized uh, momenta you can have in 5D. So this is a very quick way of seeing that you have a Kaluza-Klein tar of states, and it's inherently related to the fact that, um, that you're, you're working in an extra-dimensional theory. You can't, it's really non-negotiable that all of these states will live there because they simply correspond to the allowed momentum states in the extra dimension. Of course, if you have some weirdo geometry in the extra dimension, then the, 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 the states won't have the same kaluza klein spectrum as, as for a particle in a flat box, but they will have the, 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 the spectrum you expect for a particle in a curved box, or whatever the geometry of that box is. OK, is this reasonably clear? Yep, super. OK, so now let's ramp up and go to a little bit more detail. So we can... Um, uh, Study the metric, 
and ask what the metric looks like. So we can take a line element in 5D, and it has to be, it follows exactly the same um, uh, uh, form as it does in 4D in general relativity. We have the, the full uh, D-dimensional um, metric, and then our coordinates, dxm, dxm. So it's just a standard line element. And we can now imagine that there's some background geometry. Of course, we need to have Lorentz symmetry in 4D. So there's no background geometry um, that depends on the 4D uh, uh, spatial com space time components because we're, we want to have a theory that reduces to a theory in 4D that has 4D Lorentz invariance. But there could, of course, be non-trivial geometry going on in the, in the extra dimension. So in general, we can have a metric that depends, a background metric, once you've solved Einstein's equations and done all the hard work, a background metric that depends on the extra dimensions. So we can always choose a frame in which this background metric, I'm, I'm eliminating the uh, uh, extra dimensional fluctuations of the, of the graviton at the moment. We can choose a frame in which this extra dimensional metric has a, a form like this. So this is some overall factor that depends on the geometry of the, the, the extra dimensional space. We will have a 4D metric, I'll call them G mu nu, which is a function of just the 4D coordinates. And the, the extra dimensional part Typically, you can see, you'll see, you know, if you study the literature, scenarios where you have a factor just multiplying this, or a factor just multiplying this, or an overall factor. You can always do, well, not always, if there are singularities and things, you can't do this, but if it's a relatively smooth space, you can typically do a, a coordinate transformation which pulls all of the dependence out into some generic pre-factor pre in front of everything, which is what we will work with. Um, in here, I've written g mu nu and not eta mu nu because I want to carry along with me the 4D massless graviton that we know will exist if we have a, a, a zero momentum eigenstate in the extra dimension. So we're carrying along the, the massless graviton, but implicitly what I've done, the full set of fluctuations in this case would look like you know, e to the a. Um, and then you'd have a big matrix where here we have the, the 4D components, and then you do have vectors and scalars living along here, and I've set them to zero. So I'm not uh, going, to, to, going to discuss these extra, extra dimensional fluctuations. You can typically choose a gauge um, where most of them go to zero. And one of them uh, you can think of as this, if, if, for example, if you just did 5D, you can think of this as having a vector living in here, a scalar living in here, and a a vector living in here. And typically, what happens, one way of seeing what's happening is that here we have the 4D graviton, and it has two degrees of freedom. Um, and here we have a massless vector, which is two degrees of freedom, and a scalar, which is two degree, one degree of freedom. And um, you can show, it's quite a trivial exercise to show that a massive graviton in 4D has five degrees of freedom. So one way you can interpret this is that each um, massive graviton we get in 4D, so satisfying this equation, so they have some extra dimensional momentum, it's like having a, for each one of them, it's like having a massless graviton in 4D that is eaten, like in the Higgs mechanism, eaten a massless graviton and a massless scalar. So just like with a vector, a massive, a massive vector in 4D, we can think of that as being a massless vector with two degrees of freedom, which eats a scalar to become a massive vector with three degrees of freedom. That uh, logic continues up to extra, up to it for the for the graviton as well in extra dimensions, where the the two you get five degrees of freedom for a massive graviton from two in here, two in here, and and one in here. But we're going to forget about those fluctuations. There's a lot of interesting uh, things you can do with them. We're going to forget about them. And we're now just going to calculate um, the Einstein-Hilbert action for this metric. So we calculate the, the usual Einstein-Hilbert action. And it's uh, an integral over the entire space. We now have the um, extra dimensional uh, Planck scale. So in four dimensions, this would be m Planck, and we have uh, it's squared. But in five dimensions, it's cubed, and so on, m5 cubed. And it's, as always, written like this. 
You take the root of the determinant of the metric and the Ricci scalar. But now we can, we can just separate this out. Again, this is an interesting exercise. You, there's a, a very simple procedure for taking the 5D, I'll call this R5, the 5D uh, Ricci scalar for a metric of this form and writing it in terms of a 4D one plus some other terms that we're going to ignore. Because we're just interested in the 4D one because we're interested in what's going to happen to the 4D Planck scale. That's G4. So I, I've, do, I've done that procedure. I've put, plugged in this form of the metric in here and in here. You get this over a factor. That's n, n minus 2 over n. This is all in the notes, as, as usual, by the way. So if you don't get it all copied down, that's fine. Um, and I've thrown away the extra terms that you get when you um, uh, go from the 5D Ricci scalar to the 4D Ricci scalar. So, and the reason I've done this is those terms are there. But what we're interested in is what, in the end, um, multiplies the 4D Einstein-Hilbert term. The 4D Einstein-Hilbert term is just this guy here, uh, written in the usual way, just like the 5D one is this guy here. So we can calculate what the 4D one looks like, and it has to be equal to, um, well, I'll write it what, it what it is here. So we will, uh, the 4D Einstein-Hilbert term should be equal to the usual guy, d4x over m Planck squared root of minus g4 r4 of g4. Comparing the 4d to this, to the 4d part of the 5d, we can then see that the 4d, four-dimensional uh, Planck scale is given by this equation. So we actually have a formula, once we know what the extra dimensional geometry is, we know what this function is, we have a formula for deriving the effective 4D Planck scale that we see for 4D gravity as a function of the 5D or n dimensional uh, geometry. Okay, so now let's do some examples. Is that clear to everyone? Clear enough? So let's look at the flat, the flat case. So now let's imagine we have n extra dimensions which are um, just in a box. So they're all flat and we're just uh, talking about some, some extra dimensional box. Then the 4D Planck scale is related to the n-dimensional Planck scale, like this. So this is the product over all of the extra dimensions, essentially the volume. And if you assume all of the size of all of the extra dimensions to be the same, just for simplicity, then the, the radius of the extra dimensions is given by a formula that looks like, so this is just solving this equation here, uh, 2 times 10 to the 32 over n minus 4 minus 19 over 5 to the 2 over n minus 4. This is in the notes. You can calculate it yourself as well. 1 TV over mn. The n minus 2 over n minus 4 meters. That's the size of the extra dimensions. So we can plug in n here. So for, for n equals 5, so this is the total number, so this is one extra dimension. We uh, plug this in, and we get that, the, the, that R0 is of the order of the distance between uh, the Sun and Jupiter. Um, which is, of course, ruled out. This means that we would experience 
uh, we are we are uh, 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 smaller than experience you know gravity on distance scales smaller than this. So we would be experiencing five dimensional gravity now and not four dimensional gravity. So this is completely ruled out. You could also have ascertained this just by um, uh, finding the R here that would give you a coupling small enough that this could live around the, the TV scale. However, if we go to n equals six, then this becomes uh, something like a millimeter. So already by going to, to two extra dimensions, um, <clears throat> you can generate a, a, a 4D Planck scale from a, a 5D theory with the Planck scale you know, near the TV scale, um, essentially then no hierarchy between the, 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 the weak scale and the, the underlying Planck scale. Um, for a theory which is on the boundary of, uh, of the sort of um, scales that can be probed gravitationally. So this is a very interesting theory and this is motivated. So the, the, this framework was first put forward by Arkani Hamid, uh, Demopoulos and Diwali. And it really motivated many, many developments. But one of, one of the interesting phenomenological ones is that, is that it really motivated pushing hard on um, short distance probes of the, the form of the gravitational interaction, fifth force experiments and so on. However, what should be noted is that um, although we have brought the fundamental Planck scale all the way down to being near the weak scale, there's another puzzle in both of these theories, which is that in, in units of the, the electroweak scale, you know, we're talking, uh, uh, you know, 10 to the minus 17 meters or something like that would be the weak scale. We actually have now, we've lost one hierarchy, which is the weak scale to the fundamental Planck scale, but we've gained another one which is the weak scale to the radius. The inverse radius is a very, very low energy quantity here. You're talking wavelengths of a millimeter in this case. So there's actually another puzzle as to why you can have that hierarchy. So in some sense, you could argue that, and people have argued, that this doesn't resolve the hierarchy problem entirely. It sort of shifts it into a different hierarchy, which would be the hierarchy between the fundamental Planck scale and the actual uh, size of the extra dimension. And also typically, I won't go through it, but in, in these theories, the, there is a, a, if you don't stabilize the, the size of the extra dimension, so if you don't do anything to fix the size, the, 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 the distance between the two ends of the extra dimension, then you'll have a massless scalar field, which is no, known as the radion, and it actually, you can interpret it as living in, in this component here of the metric. And this radion is massless, which means, and the radion really measures the size of the extra dimension. So it means it costs zero energy to change the size of the extra dimension. So you have to stabilize it somehow. You have to do some breaking of, of 5D Lorentz invariance in such a way that the, the radion um, uh, is, has a mass and a local minimum, which um, fixes the size of its of its uh, uh, expectation value such that the, the radius of the extra dimension is fixed. But you can see then how this translates into another form of hierarchy problem because now we need to have a, 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 a scalar with a very, very small VEV essentially, just like we have with the Higgs, um, despite the fact that there are other big scales uh, floating around in the theory. Okay, so, um, so that is one class, is class of approaches. And then following this, I think, you know, a year or two later, um, a different class of approaches was pr proposed, which are known as um, uh, randall sundrum models. And here, um, I'm going to use an analogy. We don't have, I'd like to get onto supersymmetry quite soon, um, so we won't spend too much time on this, but I'm going to use an analogy with, with inflation. So I'm sure you've all, you're all familiar with the idea of inflation. It solves um, hierarchy problems in cosmology. So the flatness problem and the horizon problem um, can be interpreted as, as being hierarchy or sort of they look like fine tune. If, if you didn't have inflation, they look like you have a set of initial conditions that are extremely fine tuned. Um, and how inflation solves that is that you have a, a, a large cosmological constant in the past which gives you, which when you solve Einstein's equations, gives you the inflating solution. Um, 
which looks like you know uh, g m n is equal to minus g m n. Um, so this is just Einstein's equation. It's the you know essentially the equations of motion for the metric. Um, so you can t let's take this analogy and and run with it a little bit. So we look at the line element in uh, in some geometry, and in the inflating scenario we have it looks like this root two alpha over three t sum over the the extra dimensions or all of the dimensions. This is when we have positive cosmological constant. This is the usual inflating solution. We see that there's um, the, the inflating scale factor here. But if you flip the sign, so if you have a, a positive sign, when you solve Einstein's equations, you can have a metric that looks like this. Um, so now we have a sort of a, a, an inflating scale factor when we flip the sign of the cosmological constant, but this inflating scale factor um, is now, it doesn't act in this frame. Of course, you can change frames to move things around. Here, the, the, the scale factor was a function of time and multiplied all of the spatial coordinates. Here, it's a function of one of the spatial coordinates and it multiplies all of the other, spa all of the, all the other space time uh, coordinates in this way. So we can use a sort of a, a quick analogy, which is that, that um, if you imagine walking along uh, um, uh, time, essentially, during inflation, then scales are exponentially diluted as we move along time. So that's essentially what uh, uh, um, the inflation is doing. It's wiping out, exponentially wiping out um, uh, scales in, in in, spatial, uh, in our spatial dimensions. And with Randall Sundrum, what you can hope to do is that as we move along some extra dimension, so you sit at some point in an extra dimension, and you move along, and these are, our, these are the 4D space-time components, we see that the, the 4D scales are going to be exponentially diluted as we move along. And we can see that uh, more specifically by actually considering the, the Higgs mass in one extra dimension. So we're going to put in, put in a brain in the extra dimension, and we're going to put a scalar, we'll put, put the Higgs in, living on that brain. And we're going to move the position of the brain and, yep. Um, no, you can, you can choose. You can choose. So, um, so if we take, for example, the fermions, the chiral matter, this, what I did here, applies to, to any particle, particle living in the bulk. So you could have them living on, if you have them living on a brain, and say the graviton living in the bulk, then you have a fully four-dimensional standard model, and its couplings, it only feels the couplings to, to the graviton and the KK modes of the graviton um, that come from the wave functions evaluated at that position. So that's the overlap between these wave functions and the brain. But you can also, um, you could also put them in the bulk if you wanted. And then the couplings come from, from evaluating the wave function. This is, happens more in Randall syndrome, to be honest. Um, evaluating the wave function um, integral of the, the massless graviton overlapping with the, the, the uh, massless Higgs, or not massless, light Higgs, or massless fermions. You can actually, you can choose. So, and, and actually with Randall Sundrum, we'll, we'll get to it in a second, but there's a game that you can play, which is that, well, and with flat extra dimensions as well, but it happens, people use it more in Randall Sundrum. You can even choose uh, masses in the extra dimensions such that the profiles of the standard model fields are different. You can have different wave functions. And then when you integrate over those wave functions, they can have different overlaps. And this can, for example, explain the flavor hierarchy. You could have essentially that, that um, you know, the first generation is light because it's localized away from the Higgs, whereas the third generation is heavy because it's localized towards the Higgs. So there's a whole suite of model building games that you can play um, to do with how the standard model fields are, are localized, positioned within the extra dimension, whether it's 
on, you know, strictly confined to a brain or, or living in all of it or lo localized at one side of it. Oh, exactly. So, so yes. So, so no, indeed. So, yeah. So, for a flat extra dimension to explain the the weak scale, um, indeed, this would mean that you have a kk electron, you know, and the whole tower would be living there. So, yes. Yeah, so, you can't for this for this thing. But, um, but what I mean for flat extra dimensions is that, in fact, if you uh, choose a much smaller flat extra dimension, so one that has um, an energy. Uh, uh, that does not explain the, small, the, the, the electroweak hierarchy. You can play these games in flat extra dimensions for flavor, so you can have localization. You can have the extra dimension become super symmetric, so that it's partially explaining the hierarchy, and then the, the extra dimensional Planck scale is at some intermediate scale. There's a whole suite of things you can do. But indeed, that's the reason that um, people tend to do this game of putting, if you, if you really want to explain the the, the, the um, weak scale, Planck scale hierarchy. When people put things in the bulk, it's usually in Randall Sundrum, because in Randall Sundrum, the first KK mode is of order the curvature, so of order uh, uh, related to the parameter the, that's in here, which is related to this parameter here, of order the curvature. So if the curvature is high, then um, the first KK mode may be around a TeV or something like this. So you could have all sorts of things living in the bulk. But there's a, there was a huge industry in exploring all of these possibilities. And there are many things you can do. You can even, for example, have um, uh, uh, you know, the fermions confined to a brain and the gauge bosons in the bulk, the Higgs on a brain and the fermions and gauge in the bulk, things like this. Um, you, you don't want to break gauge symmetry. So for example, uh, it's hard to have fermions in the bulk but not gauge in the bulk and things like this. There are, there are, there are all sorts of uh, things you can do. Okay, so let's put in our put in the brain um, in one extra dimension and put the Higgs in it. So, um, and we're going to put it in Randall Sundrum. So the 4D action on the brain looks like this. So we have the 5D integral. I'm going to call the extra dimension Y. We have a delta function that confines it to the position Y zero. Um, to preserve diffeomorphism invariance, you have the, the determinant of the full 5D metric, but you also have to divide by the um, fifth component, so I'll call it minus G55, so it should be minus in there. Oh no, sorry, plus G55. This absorbs essentially the variation here under a, diff, uh, a diffeomorphism, so you have to have this factor in there. And then we have the, the usual kinetic terms, G mu nu, D mu Higgs dagger. D, I'm not doing covariant derivatives, but you can you know, figure out how to insert them. This lambda, and then minus F squared, I'll call it squared. So this is the Higgs potential. You could call this V squared if you like. But importantly, in this, in this frame here, um, if there's no hierarchy problem, we expect this term here, whatever the VEV is or the mass term, to be comparable to the other scales in the theory. So we would expect this parameter on an EFT basis to be you know, around M5 or something like this, not, not too far from it. But then let's insert the specific form of the metric. Um, my root alpha is going to be, uh, become, I'm going to call it K for this example. So we insert the specific form of the metric and um, integrate over Y, so we position ourselves at Y0 and we have D4 of X e to the minus four k y zero e to the two k y zero e to mu nu d mu d nu minus lambda um, but we see here that these two terms don't cancel, so this Higgs is not canonically quantized, or is not, uh, does not have canonical kinetic terms. So we need to give it canonical kinetic terms, and to do that we just do a rescaling of the Higgs such that we have the standard 4D uh, kinetic term. And we do that 
So this is the, the action that we would observe in our 4D world. And you see that after doing this rescaling, it's like a conformal rescaling, the only parameter that has a leftover dependence on the position, which is why not, is the only dimensionful parameter left over, because the lambda times Higgs squared is a quartic interaction, uh, which is scale invariant. The only parameter that depends on it is this F squared here. So we see that our, what we measure to be the Higgs mass, the natural value of the Higgs mass, at a position why not, depends exponentially on the, the, the position. So if we were to live at one end of the, one end of the extra dimension where y0 is 0, we expect the natural value of the Higgs mass to be around m5. But if we go, um, or comparable to that scale, but if we go to um, the other end of the extra dimension, y is, you know, let's call it L or pi r, you can choose whatever convention you want, you see that you expect the natural value of the Higgs mass that you measure to be exponentially smaller than uh, the other typical scales in the theory. And this is essentially the randall syndrome approach, but also... Um, it has many, many uh, deep and interesting connections to um, other formal aspects of, of theoretical physics. So, for example, using ADS um, CFT, you can relate this um, ADS 5D picture, uh, broadly speaking, to a 4D uh, CFT picture where you have um, an approximate conformal field theory just in 4D with large, um, uh, with, with, with a, a, a lot of running uh, going on where you get spat out uh, at the scale at which this, the conformal field theory is broken, some light scalars, so you can, uh, can actually reinterpret uh, models of composite Higgs theories where the Higgs is spat out as a PNGB, as we discussed in the, the second lecture, um, in a five-dimensional context. So we have a tool, this five-dimensional context gives us a tool for understanding structural aspects of, of strongly coupled theories and strongly coupled pictures of, of the Higgs boson and so on. So there are many interesting and deep interconnections. These are just the absolute bare minimum basic tools for sort of playing around with extra-dimensional theories. Um, but they are very, very useful. And they also give um, uh, lead to a sort of uh, an explosion of, a, of um, um, technical tools that are for effective field theories that are unrelated to symmetries. So at the start, in the first lecture, I really went on at length about how if you have, um, you know, from an effective field theory, theory perspective, if you have parameters that appear to be uh, smaller than you expect in your effective field theory, that that um, usually means there should be some sort of symmetry reason for that, that there's some spurion type field in the, the IR and in the UV, which um, breaks the symmetry by a small amount. But what this sort of unleashed on the theory community was a different approach, which is locality. Essentially, um, imagine you have a field that has a, a wave function that's strongly peaked over at this side. Maybe it's uh, some scalar field or something like this. And you have some other scalar field which has a wave function that's strongly peaked over at this, at this side, then when you, or maybe even you know, very peaked, confined to this brain, then when you integrate over the two wave functions to find out what the 4D coupling of those particles looks like, um, it can be very small. And the reason for its smallness isn't a symmetry, it's locality in an extra dimension. It's really, um, another term we use for it is, is sequestering. And you can actually build this in, even without going to five dimensions, because you can... Um, do a thing called, I, I don't have time to go through it, but it's a, a lot of fun, um, dimensional deconstruction, where you do what a lattice field theorist does. So what does a lattice field theorist do? He takes a continuum theory, and um, at each point along an extra dimension, there's uh, an infinite number of degrees of freedom associated with each field that's, that's living in, that, in a dimension. And then you break that continuum theory up into a discrete theory, so you break it up into a distinct set of lattice points. So now you have... A, uh, instead of a, con a continuum of fields, you have a, a different field living at each point, and it has connections with the next nearest neighbors, which depend on the derivatives. You know, the derivative in space is just the value here minus the value here divided by the lattice spacing. So this is just the, 
the, the definition of, of, of a derivative. And it turns out you can do exactly the same thing for BSM physics. So you can take your extra dimension, turn it into a discrete set of points, and you get a set of next to nearest neighbor interactions. And you can write this in a purely four-dimensional way. And it allows you to use um, this locality or, or um, uh, uh, sort of this locality in, in the extra dimension as a theory tool where it becomes essentially locality in theory space. It becomes um, uh, dependent on how uh, different sets of theories that neighbor each other in a, in a lattice sense um, interact. So it's a very useful tool. I, I I'm not, don't have time to go through it today, but there's a lot on that uh, in, in the notes. And it's a very useful and interesting tool um, for constructing beyond the standard model theories or, yes? Yes. 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 No, it turns out, um, so there's a mechanism uh, known as the Goldberger Wise mechanism um, that makes this very easy. Um, in particular, for um, uh, uh, Randall Sundrum model. And here's how it works. So you choose. In your extra dimension, you choose, um, you have a scalar with a bulk mass. And when you solve, so if you have a scalar with zero bulk mass, then it will have um, a mass spectrum and a wave function dictated purely by the geometry. So depending on what you choose for your boundary conditions, um, uh, that sets it. But now imagine you put, for the scalar, let's call it phi, you put a potential on this brain where phi is minimized um, where with phi equals, let's call it F0. So it looks like a Higgs-like potential, just like on that, just like there, um, on this brain. And you put a, a separate Higgs-like potential on this one with a different VEV. So it's telling you that the boundary conditions want you to have a VEV that is at F, F0 here. And they want you to be, have a VEV which is F1 here. But also the geometry dictates, there's also a, ma that, that means when I expand about that VEV, there's a mass here and a mass there. Um, so solving Einstein's equations across the brain, that leads to a boundary condition on the derivatives of the field at that value. So you solve the whole thing self-consistently, including in the bulk, where you have to satisfy the equations of motion for the scalar field in the bulk. And it will have some um, uh, uh, equation, some um, solution, which will have be some generic complicated function, but you can solve it in some cases analytically. And then what you see happens is that this guy here, the curvature, from going how you curve from going from here to here, um, is dictated entirely by the geometry. It's not negotiable. Once you've once you've solved the the boundary conditions with the masses, then you have to have a certain gradient here and a certain gradient here. And the only way you can get that certain gradient at, consistent with the bulk equations of motion is with some, some guy like this. Now, imagine I move, I try and move this brain. I can know, if I move the brain, then, because this has some gradient, if I've moved it over here, this keeps going down, and the value of phi over here is no longer F1. So you see you've gone up the potential. You've actually cost yourself some energy to shift the position of the brain. Which means that self-consistently, although this field phi we've just put in the bulk, it doesn't look like it measures the size of the extra dimension. But you can see here that, that physically what's happening is you can, if you have a potential for that field that's on, on the two brains that gives it, wants it to have a, one VEV here and a different VEV here, then that will actually set, self-consistently when you minimize the energy, set a radius for the extra dimension. And the mass cost of changing that radius, the fluctuation, um, the mass of the fluctuation of changing that radius is uh, proportional to the mass on the, on the brains of this scalar field. So uh, you, can, you can solve um, uh, the moduli stabilization problem in this way. In Randall Sundrum, it turns out that works pretty naturally. But in um, large extra dimensions, you have to tune a parameter somewhere because, uh, like I said, this has to be a very, very large extra dimension, which means that you need to have something that that is, has very 
Um, to stabilize it, has, is it going to involve very, very small VEVs, and then there, you, re, you come back up against this naturalist problem. Does that answer your question? Sure. Any more questions before, yep. Ah, no, so, so, so I'm not advocating that you really do lattice physics. What I'm saying is that you use the tools of the lattice, so you don't, even need, you don't need to put it on a computer. So by the tools of the lattice, I mean the formal tools, the, the tool of how you put a, a, a quantum field theory on the lattice. So how that works is imagine we have, um, uh, and this will look very like condensed matter, so imagine we have um, an extra dimensional theory. We'll put a scalar, a massless scalar in 5D. And I'm going to split up the, the, the derivatives. So we have, I'll call it D, D mu phi, D mu phi. I'm going to work in mostly plus metric because I prefer it. So dy, dy phi. I'm probably going to make a mistake here, so, so um, help me out if I do. Um, so now let's turn this, this extra dimension into a lattice. So just the way a lattice field theorist would do it. So now the integral over dy becomes a sum over extra dimensional points. You know, we're, we're with this, flat extra, this uh, flat extra dimension, and now we're turning it into a set of points like this. Um, a field living at a point Y um, now becomes a set of fields living at each, let's call it phi A, living at, it, at each um, lattice point. So it's a, if we're just turning one of the dimensions into a lattice, then the, the continuum now becomes a sum over a set of points where there's a 4D field living at each lattice point. And finally, what's a derivative? Well, we know what a derivative is, dy of phi is the limit, as a goes to zero, of phi at i plus one a. So it's, I, call it, I would just call it phi i plus one um, and x. So let me just call it like this, phi i plus one of x minus phi of i at x, um, where i plus one is labeling the position along the extra dimension um, over a. So it's that dumb. Uh, so now you do this. And our, our new action becomes to go over d4x. And then we have a sum of, uh, put the half out the front, d mu phi i squared. Plus, we now have uh, 1 over a squared, phi i plus 1 minus phi i squared. And let me put a big square bracket just to. So this is a dimensionally deconstructed scalar. It looks like a sum of n, where n is the number of lattice points, n free scalars, free massless scalars, with next to nearest mass terms. And you can diagonalize this, this mass matrix, and you will get a massless mode. Um, well, depending on the boundary conditions, you will get a, a massless mode and a whole KK tower of states, but they're no longer what you had before as being some um, uh, continuum of states in a flat extra dimension that would have been a KK tower like this going to infinity. We've now limited because the, there are infinite states because I said at each point in 5D you have a single um, 4D field. That's one way of thinking about it. So you originally had a continuum, so you have infinite numbers of 4D field, which is why you have to have an infinite number of KK modes. But now we have a finite number. So what we get is a band of states that terminates at some, some value um, and our, our mass of state here when we diagonalize this mass matrix. And for example, now imagine if we had had some field that interacts with phi at the end of the brain here. In this scenario here, our field that is just inter interacting with phi n at the end. And when you diagonalize this mass matrix, it will have some um, overlap with the massless mode, but also some overlap with uh, the massive modes as well. So yeah, that's what I mean. I don't mean really put it on the lattice, but, but use the tools of lattice, lattice field theory. <laughs>
It turns out in the RS case it's fine because all of the, you're not putting in any hierarchically large or small parameters, you just put in a bulk scalar. You make the mass a little bit small, the bulk mass a little bit small because you don't want to upset the geometry. The, this VEV, this profile for the field does actually change the geometry a bit. But because you've not tuned anything, if you calculate radiative corrections, it stays not really tuned, so it will change the parameters by a perturbative amount, but it doesn't change the qualitative result. Okie doke. Yep. Yep. Right. Yeah, so the question was, can you take in RS the, the 5D cosmological constant to be of order the fundamental scale? And the answer is yes, um, which is why it's really a bona fide solution to the hierarchy problem. Of course, we haven't seen the KK modes at the LHC, so phenomenologically, that's a different story, but um, we have to tune it a bit now. But structurally, there's really very little tuning you have to do anywhere. And you could ask exactly the same question for large extra dimensions and say, well, why is my bulk CC so small? Because you essentially have, one way of seeing it is that you have three, in terms of cosmological constants, you have three parameters. You um, have one on each brain, so that's two, and one in the bulk. There's a CC for each of these terms. There's a potential on, on all th in all three places. Now, we know we're going to have to tune to get a small 4D CC. So we know we can do one tuning. Um, to set this, you know, when you integrate over the, all of the CCs, to set the sum of those CCs to be small. Um, but in large extra dimensions, there's an additional tuning, which is that you, in addition to that, you have to set the bulk CC to be small, as well as tuning them all to cancel. Because if you didn't set it to be small, it would no longer be a flat extra dimension, it would be RS. So essentially, RS is like taking a flat extra dimension and doing what you would expect from an, an EFT perspective and just putting a, a M5-ish uh, bulk CC in there. Okay, any other questions? Nope. Okay, so we will get through um, a bit of supersymmetry, probably not all of it, but uh, enough to give you an idea. Okay, so again, just like with, with extra dimensions, you know, um, there is merit in supersymmetric theories that goes well beyond, you know, the CMSSM or something like this. And so you shouldn't uh, dismiss supersymmetry as a sort of tool, as, as a weapon in your toolkit, because you never know when you're going to want to use it. You may be studying some property of whatever you end up doing, some property of a strongly coupled QFT or whatever, and it may turn out that actually just the tool for the job for getting a good qualitative understanding of uh, some part of physics is, uh, some part of relevant physics is to use a, a supersymmetric model as a first approximation. So it's a very useful tool. It shows up everywhere. And also we should know, I think any theorist should know about the possible space-time symmetries of nature. And supersymmetry is sort of the last, the last port of call. So supersymmetry is, uh, so we know that um, in flat 4D space, we have the Poincaré symmetry. And supersymmetry is an extension of Poincaré. In the sense that um, it extends the bosonic symmetries, like translations, um, rotations, and boosts of Poincaré symmetry, to um, a um, fermionic symmetry. And just like in any symmetry, we have generators. So remember, for, for our for, uh, standard, sorry, for the, the global symmetries we talked about a few days ago, we had generators which are just um, the, the, for example, for SU2, it's just the Pauli matrices. For SU3, it's the Gelman matrices. And they generate a transformation, an infinitesimal transformation, um, by shifting things, say, alpha i, some infinitesimal parameter. Um, proportional to uh, the generator. So if you have something in the fundamental representation, you do a symmetry transformation, an infinitesimal one, by multiplying the fundamental you know, vector by this uh, exponentiated matrix. 
We also know what generators look like for, for space-time translations, for example. You know, x, the, the uh, field valued at x mu plus alpha mu, where alpha is some small parameter, is well approximated by x mu, well, is by definition given by the full Taylor expansion, by x mu plus, you know, half of, plus all the other terms, you know, the proportional to alpha squared and so on. And we can represent this transformation, this translation, um, infinitesimally as uh, with a generator, which is just the derivative, acting on the field phi. So P mu, which is the derivative essentially, is the, is the generator for translations. So this is something we all know about. For SUSY, the generator is, uh, the generator is called, we'll call it Q here. And it is a fermionic variable, so you can think of it as being a vial spinner. It carries some, uh, some index. In addition to the, to the Poincaré uh, symmetry, so every symmetry has an algebra. You know, the algebra for the normal groups that we, yep. Oh, sorry, yes, I'll try and write a bit bigger. Um, uh, there's an algebra, for example, for standard global symmetries, which is given by essentially the commutation relations of the, of the generators of that group. Um, there's the, the algebra for the generators of the Poincaré uh, group. Um, and in SUSY, we, we add to that an algebra. So a symmetry should have, the, should have an algebra, um, which satisfies these commutation and anti-commutation relations. Um, as you can see, these generators, because they carry spin, they essentially uh, change the spin of, of uh, fields. Um, and we can just like here, we wrote an element of the group um, as an infinitesimal parameter, uh, an exponentiation of an infinitesimal parameter multiplying the generators. And we can do the same here. If we have a, an element of the, the Poincaré group, we can write it as a function of now the full supersymmetric coordinate space. So we've extended the 4D space-time coordinates to include a fermionic coordinate, which I'm calling theta. So the full supersymmetric coordinate space um, has group elements that look like this. And when we, we can act on, so just like we can um, uh, uh, generate additional elements of the group by m multiple actions. So we could act on this guy where I have alpha i replaced by beta i and this can, can, um, is uh, equivalent to a shift of alpha i plus beta i. You can do the same thing here. And when I act on, um, uh, I'm not just going to write it out because of time, but when I act on this guy with another supersymmetric transformation proportional to zeta, then you get a group element that has this form, except now x has been shifted, so x prime of mu is x mu plus i theta sigma mu uh, zeta hat bar minus i zeta sigma mu theta bar. And where theta has shifted um, as a shift, shifted proportionally to um, zeta. Okay, so these are the fundamentals of, of the, the, the group of supersymmetric transformations. And you can see here, I've replaced um, what, the derivative by the, the derivative here by the generator, which I'm calling P mu, but you can remember it's derivative. And similarly, you can um, write uh, an operator that generates supersymmetric um, translations um, in the following way. We will call it Q, so that a supersymmetric uh, uh, translation proportional to zeta is given, just like here, a, a translation proportional to x mu is given by um, uh, this operator here, q, 
Okay. So this is just a very, very uh, lightning review of the, the properties of the symmetry. But just like when, when we were actually working with quantum field theories that have global symmetries, we're interested in the actual representations. We have fields, for example, SU2. We have fields that live in a representation of SU2. Oh, for the standard model, we always work with the fundamental representations. We just have vectors, complex vectors with two components. With QCD, we have fields that live in the, the fundamental representation of QCD. So we have vectors, fields that are a vector of three complex components. So now we want to build up some sort of representation of supersymmetry so that we can study it at, um, in quantum field theories. And what we have now is no longer fields, but superfields. So these are um, fields that have some definite transformation under, under supersymmetry. And just like a field is a function of the space-time coordinates, a superfield has to be a function of the superspace coordinates x, theta, and theta bar. So we can just do the, the most dumb thing you, you could imagine. We say our superfield is now called f, for example, of x, theta, and theta bar. So now this is a generic function, just like a field is a generic function. This is a gen or up to some constraints like complex or real or whatever. This is a generic complex function of um, uh, the superspace coordinates. But what's interesting is that the thetas are spinners, uh, which means that they satisfy uh, Grassmann uh, commutation relations, which means that if the same component of a spinner encounters itself twice, it vanishes. This is something uh, you can look up in, 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 in Wikipedia. Um, so then the smallest thing, so we can actually tailor expand so we tailor expand it here in terms of x mu, but we can actually tailor expand in, in terms of the superspace coordinates. And we get a tailor expansion which actually terminates, because once you have too many powers of theta, because it's a Grassmann variable, you get zeros. So we can actually do this tailor expansion. So we do f of x, 0, 0, and so on, and keep going. And when we do this, we find that this superfield contains a, a scalar field here. Uh, a fermion here, so theta, if you remember, is a spinner, so this guy has to be a spinner. Another fermion, another scalar. Theta squared is um, uh, the Lorentz contraction, so there's an epsilon in there, it's theta, epsilon, theta. So you have, if you were to think of this in two component spinners, this gives you theta, the top component, multiplied by theta, the bottom component. If you had theta the top component twice, it vanishes because it's Grassmann. Um, and another uh, uh, scalar. And a vector. And another fermion. And finally, uh, a scalar. OK, so this um, is not by definition. This is just what happens if you expand, Taylor expand this in, as a function of theta and theta bar. And it terminates because we've absorbed as many. We've got a, in here, we've got a theta, theta 1, theta 2. And we have a theta bar 1, theta bar 2. If we put in any more thetas, we'll have an, at least a copy of um, uh, one of those components twice, which will vanish. OK, and it has a definite, this guy here has a definite, super, uh, definite transformation. So just like we know how the group acts, for example, in SU2, how the, the group elements act on the representation. Similarly, we have uh, the group elements here, and they act on um, uh, this representation in a definite manner. So a SUSY transformation proportional to zeta let me do this a bit lower. A Susie transformation proportional to zeta of this superfield um, is given by the contraction of zeta with the, the generators. Furthermore, so we, we, we now have our representation um, 
for a, a, a supersymmetric theory. But furthermore, because this, this um, uh, expansion always terminates, if I were to take the product of two different superfields, call one F and call the other one H or something like this, you take the product and the product has to have this form because of the termination of the expansion of the thetas, it will always terminate. So if I do F times H, I will get a scalar here which is, looks like F times H and I'll get scalars multiplied by fermions and so on. It'll be a complicated mess, but nonetheless, it has, itself has to be a superfield. So superfield times superfield is superfield. Superfield times any number of superfields is a superfield. Um, and that's only because this, this, uh, it will always take this form because the, the uh, expansion um, terminates. Okay, so in some sense, this is a reducible representation. As we will see, we can find smaller superfields that have uh, definite transformations under supersymmetry. And one of them is, I'm not gonna go through it because there isn't time, but one of them, the smallest superfield essentially, or one of the small superfields that is complex is known as a chiral superfield. And it turns out that we can find a chiral superfield by taking a, a, a general superfield like this and eliminating some of the, some of the components. So we will eliminate, um, let's eliminate Actually, no, let's not do it that way. I'll just write it down, there isn't, uh, isn't time. So a chiral superfield looks like this. So A of X is a complex scalar. Uh, psi here is a, a fermion. And F is a complex scalar. And when I perform this supersymmetry transformation on this uh, superfield, this chiral superfield, the individual fields transform in this way. Sorry, there's a lot, of, a lot of writing to do. Okay, so we can spot uh, a few different things. And there's much more detail, by the way, in the notes. The transformation of the scalar transforms it proportionally to zeta into a fermion. The transformation of the fermion involves the bosons, the two scalars. And even more interestingly, the, the um, transformation of this uh, component, this scalar, which is the theta squared component, um, is proportional to a total derivative. You see this is zeta, which is just some, some constant spinner, uh, the Pauli matrix, and then d mu of psi, which is telling us that we've just discovered a Susie invariant. If we take, we call this the f component usually. If we take the f component, of any some, some superfield, doesn't matter what the superfield is, then under a supersymmetry transformation, that F component will transform to a total derivative. And as we've gone through at length, the total derivatives don't enter into any of the, the perturbative um, S matrix elements or anything like that. So it's an invariant. Also, um, if we take the, uh, I'm not going to do it, but if we take the theta bar squared, theta squared, uh, component of any superfield, the same thing is true. So we call this the D term. The D term under a supersymmetry transformation transforms up to a total derivative. And uh, so does the F term of a chiral superfield, which is a, a, uh, a smaller representation. You can see there's only 
two scalars and a fermion living in this field. Um, and because of this, we can actually write down generic um, uh, SUSY invariant theory. So the last tool um, you would come across is more of a, of a slick way of writing these theories, writing down actions for these theories. This is all for n equals 1 supersymmetry, by the way. It changes a lot if you go to n equals 2. Um, so for n equals 1 supersymmetry, we can write down now, knowing that this guy transforms up to a total derivative, and this guy transforms up to a total derivative, means, and, and combine that with the fact that a product of superfields is a superfield, means that we can take any polynomials of these superfields and their co complex conjugates, and extract D terms and F terms, and we will have a SUSY invariant. So the way we write that is, uh, is the following. We write it as an integral over a superspace, where essentially the, the definition of this integral, uh, d, d squared theta, is over theta squared is one, but d squared theta over some number is zero. This is sort of actually more of a definition than uh, something you can derive, I think. Um, but for our purposes, you can take it as a definition. So then we can take the, um, for example, this is called the, the, the Keeler potential. So we're now taking general superfields that have thetas and theta bars in it. And we extract the d term. So we integrate over d squared theta and d squared theta bar to extract what we call a d term. And this is known as the Keeler potential. It's just jargon busting. You don't need to know what Keeler potential means. But this is how we refer to it. And then um, we can extract for chiral superfields, which are just functions of, uh, uh, of these uh, complex scalars and uh, fermions. We can extract uh, the f component, which is the theta squared term, from a, an analogous integration over superface, superspace, uh, just over uh, d squared theta. And then a generic uh, potential might have some uh, linear terms. I'll just call this call it f, it's just my, my choice of, of uh, notation. Some linear terms in the fields, you might have some quadratic terms. Some cubic terms. And so on. And this is often referred to as the superpotential. Okay, so it turns out that when we extract, we do this procedure and extract the theta squared, theta bar squared, and extract the theta squared terms from here, we'd also usually add the Hermitian conjugate, um, we get a supersymmetric theory because we know we have constructed a theory which can, under any supersymmetric transformation, will transform up to a total derivative. So I can always do integration by parts and kill what's been left over. Um, okay. Uh, I'll not go through gauge superfields, so this is for chiral superfields, but now you can see why we get um, uh, why we get these extra particles coming along for a ride. People in supersymmetry theorists don't add superpartner particles just for the hell of it, or just because they, um, yep. Um, so phi is the superfield. So on phi i and phi j are just different superfields. And the f component or d com and d component of any superfield is invariant up to a total derivative. Yes, only the f component, which is why we do this integral over superspace. So because of this definition, this pulls out the, uh, or this guy, just pulls out the f component, the bit proportional to theta squared, from this whole product. Ah, so, sorry, I didn't explain that well. And this guy pulls out the d component from this whole product here. Um, OK, super. Thanks. Um, so we see that, yeah, theorists, we're not just adding particles for the hell of it. 
Um, it's because this, the symmetry itself dictates it. The fact that you actually have a rep representations of supersymmetry means that you have multiple fields packaged into this structure. So if you have a scalar field like the Higgs, you will have a fermionic field, um, uh, which is the Higgsino, and so on. So don't, uh, don't believe the hype. Sometimes it's said that, you know, you know supersymmetric theories are, are totally ad hoc. Um, and for sure, they have lots of free parameters because there's a lot of flexibility in, in, in performing this procedure. But the symmetry itself, the space-time symmetry ex itself, uh, really dictates the structure. Um, OK, so when you do this, you'll see here, what you get here is the kinetic terms. I won't go through it, it but it's in the notes. The kinetic terms for all of the different um, uh, uh, fields here, the scalar, and for this fermion. But what's interesting is you don't get a kinetic term for F. Yep. Pardon? Ah, yes, so, so can you, um, very good question. So the, the whole story with the strong CP problem was total derivatives can be important um, if you have uh, interesting non-perturbative field. Uh, configurations. Um, it's a very, very good question, and it goes well beyond my knowledge in the sense that the answer is no, they, they're not typically important for things like the MSSM. But I I'm, imagine that on um, uh, in more supersymmetric theories or in different numbers of dimensions or, or if they're put on different manifolds, they could be important. So I um, as a, in the respect of advocating SUSY as a general tool for playing with quantum field theories, they could be important. But for things like the weak scale story and the MSSM, they're, they're, they're not. So we really have full supersymmetry. But when I say could, that doesn't mean that they are. I just don't know. Um, OK. So we see that we get the kinetic terms, but we don't get a kinetic term for F. And similarly here, we don't get a kinetic term for the Ds. You can see immediately why that is, because uh, when I do phi dagger phi and multiply them together, the theta squared, theta bar squared component that involves f will be theta squared, theta bar squared, f, f dagger, without any derivatives. Whereas you can see here, the theta squared, theta bar component involving a will have d mu, d mu, a, and a. So that's just the standard kinetic term. And the one involving the, the fermion will have um, uh, did I write this correctly? Oh, this should be the one involving the fermion. Sorry, I think I must have written this incorrectly. Ah, yes, theta bar. Um, we'll have, say, cross terms like a theta bar, psi bar, multiplying theta squared, uh, theta bar. So when you pull out the theta squared, theta bar squared guy, you can see you get the kinetic term for the fermion from this derivative. But f is not a propagating field. So the number of propagating, this, because there's no kinetic term, so the number of propagating fields um, is just given by a and psi. So we have the same number of degrees of freedom. Similarly, the masses of these fields um, come from this term here. And I've written mij very suggestively because mij is really the mass matrix for this theory. So um, when I extract the theta squared, how can I see this? When I extract, a, for example, phi phi term, so it's not phi phi dagger, but just phi phi. When I extract phi phi, you see I get things like um, uh, theta squared, I, I'm taking the theta squared component, theta squared f a, or I get um, uh, uh, psi squared. So the psi squared has a coefficient, which is just m. So you see it's a mass for the fermion. For the scalar, we get theta squared f and a. So we get fa plus fa all dagger. But we also have the term from the Keeler potential, which is f f dagger. So when we integrate that out, solve the equations of motion for f, we get m squared a squared. So that's giving us the mass matrix. And you see that because of this structure, you see that the masses of the fermions is identical to the masses of the, the the scalars. There are all sorts of other nice properties you can play with. So for example, you can have other symmetries. There's a particularly interesting one called an R symmetry, where theta uh, transforms under a U1 symmetry. 
Um, theta goes to e to the i alpha theta, but I won't go into it. But um, what's most interesting for, and where we, we will finish up here, for um, the hierarchy problem, and I actually, I'll just do this in detail. So you can see, let's, let's take a theory where we just have phi. So there's no, there's not different labels here. There's just, uh, we have phi dagger phi, and we have just a mass term m phi phi. So let's extract um, the, full, the full theory. We'll get the kinetic terms for phi um, and psi. We'll get a term from the killer potential, which is theta squared, theta bar squared, which will look just like uh, FF dagger. Again, as I said, no, no kinetic term for F. And we'll get a mass term that goes like M psi squared plus psi squared dagger. From the super potential. And we will get cross terms, as I said, from the, from the uh, super potential that go like M scalar component, F component, and vice versa. So we will get plus M, F, A, A is the scalar field, plus Hermitian conjugate. F has no kinetic term. So this is a kinetic term for, for A and, and Psi. F has no kinetic term. So we can actually totally integrate it out. We can do, in the path integral, we can do the Gaussian integral um, straight off by hand because there's no kinetic term, so we just get rid of them. So when we, int when we integrate them out, equi what's equivalent to doing that Gaussian integral is um, essentially taking dl by df and setting it equal to zero. Uh, minimizing this, the potential, essentially, as a function of f. And when we do that, we see that f is equal to minus m uh, a. So we plug that back in here, and what we see we get is the, the same kinetic terms, the same mass term for the fermions. and a uh, mass term for the, the scalars, which goes like this. So they have the same mass. So supersymmetry has forced them to have exactly the same mass. Um, for n equals, this is a more general theorem that you can prove not in this way, but um, for, uh, for our purposes, you can see that this just comes straight from this uh, superfield construction. So they have the same mass. So why is that interesting for quadratic divergences? Well, you can see here, from this perspective, M, as it relates to the, the fermion masses, is the only parameter that's breaking the fermion chiral symmetry. So we could have uh, physics in the ultraviolet, physics at high energies. So this is taking this EFT perspective. Physics way up in the ultraviolet. And as long as it preserves the chiral symmetry, it will never give any corrections to the, to the fermion mass that are larger than M. The fermion mass can have you know, one loop corrections and so on, but they, they're always multiplicative rather than additive. So if the UV pres preserves symmetry in that chiral symmetry, supersymmetry in that chiral symmetry, the, the fermion mass is naturally light. But this supersymmetry also dictates that the scalar mass is tied to the fermion mass. They have to be equal. So if the, if you really, if the theory is really supersymmetric, the, the, the scalar will always remain at the same mass scale as the fermion, but the mass of the fermion is protected by the chiral symmetry which is telling you that if your super theory is supersymmetric, you can comfortably have um, large scale separations, you can co comfortably have um, light fermions, but if the theory is supersymmetric, the, the scale will always come along for the ride. It essentially, this is a very ad hoc way of seeing it, but it's borrowing the chiral symmetry of the fer fermion, which means that you can naturally have light scalars, which is really remarkable. You can do this in, in practice. So you can write down a fully supersymmetric theory where the, in a supersymmetric manner, these scalars and fermions interact with very heavy scalars and fermions, you know, 10 orders of magnitude heavier. And you do the whole thing. You start at very high energies. You RG evolve down. You integrate out those heavy scalars and fermions. You do all of your EFT matching. You run all the way down to the light scale. And all that this has had is a small perturbative multiplicative correction to its mass. These, it's, the, it's really miraculous. And in a supersymmetric theory, scales involving scalars, fundamental scalars, can be arbitrarily uh, uh, separated without doing any damage to the, to the scale separation um, with respect to the, the scalar fields.
Okay, so there's much, much more than that in the notes, so, and, I, and I would urge you, if you're interested in Susie, to look into that. There's a lot more on the phenomenology and uh, dark matter candidates and all sorts of things like that. But today, I really wanted to give you a taste of um, the symmetry that's underlying it rather than the phenomenology uh, because I think the symmetry that's, that's underlying it is always going to be relevant and interesting. The phenomenology changes as, as collider probes evolve. Um, but this is a, 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 a symmetry which will always be of theoretical interest and is applicable to many areas of theoretical physics. So I'll leave it there.